Mayor Victoria Woodards. And I'm City Manager Elizabeth Polly. Welcome, Welcome back to Inside, Inside Tacoma. Tacoma. Well, Elizabeth, it's budget season around the city of Tacoma, and I know we've talked a lot, you know, we've been talking about the budget for the last couple shows, and I think it's really important that we talk about the budget. The budget is our moral document as a city. It's a thing we do every two years that says these are our priorities, and this is where we're going to spend our money. So I hope you all don't get bored, but I think it's really important for you to understand um, how we spend your tax dollars in the city of Tacoma. So Elizabeth, um, I'm excited about this conversation today. Thank you, Mayor, and let's start off with talking about our revenue sources and I think everybody's favorite topic, yeah. taxes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Right? We, we like to hope right. it's everybody's way, but I think so often people think all of their all their tax dollars, we have the highest sales tax in the state of Washington, but they think all of their tax dollars come to the city of Tacoma. So this is going to be a great discussion. So Elizabeth, where does our revenue come from and how much money does Tacoma really get of that 10.3%? Thank you, Mayor. So sales tax is one of four major sources of re revenue for the city of mm -hmm. Tacoma. And what our viewers are seeing on the screen, Mayor, is for every dollar of taxes paid, where that money goes. And as the viewers can see, over 60% of the sales tax that they pay goes to the state, and about 14% of what they pay comes to the city. Mm -hmm. Now of that, it, um, that 14% pays for things like services like police and fire, it also supports important services like affordable housing, homelessness, mental health and chemical dependency services, as well as 2% of that is based on voter approved initiatives that support our arts through Tacoma Creates and our streets initiative. Mm -hmm. the, the viewers can also see that some of their sales tax goes to the county and that helps support other really important services like our dispatch center for South Sound 911, mm -hmm. juvenile detention and other criminal justice programs. So in this coming year, the viewers might be interested to know that we're going to collect over $80 million in sales tax and about 56 million of that goes to those general fund services like community safety that I mentioned. So we don't we don't in, we don't get it all. So Elizabeth, that's one of uh, one of the tax structures we get sales tax, but we also get property tax. So can you talk a little bit about property tax and how that breaks down? Sure. So the screen has shifted to that same dollar bill, but looking at it from pro how property taxes are spent. So similar to sales tax, Mayor, a majority of property taxes that our residents pay go to other jurisdictions, including the state, mm -hmm. our school district, mm -hmm. Pierce County, and Metro Park. So, so our residents still benefit, of course, from that, but the direct um, property tax to the city is about 20 cents of that dollar. And that goes, again, to support those general fund services like community safety. Um, also, um, emergency medical and the voter, the voter approved initiatives. You'll also see important um, uh, services such as the port services funded through property tax. But again, those dollars go to the port and not to the city. So in terms of how much we collect in property tax yeah. there, 84 million is expected in this year and about 65 million of that will come into our general fund um, to support those important community priorities. So Elizabeth, so we've got sales tax, property tax, and when you put it all together, what does that look like, right? So sure. how, 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 we, how do we think about other revenues and expenses and what, are, what is really our biennial budget dollar amount um, that we spend on all the services in Tacoma? Sure. So um, our viewers might be seeing something that hopefully is a little bit familiar to I them. I think we've shown this yeah. a couple times now. We've, we show this during our budget process, and we I believe we talked about it on this show before. We did. So the outside of what we call the budget wheel that you're seeing on the screen there highlights what our revenue sources are. And you'll see there the property tax that we talked about today. And then you also see our uh, sales tax as another important um, revenue source that we talked about and that in this biennium represented 21 percent of our total revenues. Other big sources of revenues include business taxes. Again in the current biennium the wheel shows that that was 21 percent of our overall revenues 
And then we have other um, categories there of revenues that are really important. Our utility taxes, which about 19% of our revenue consists of that in our general fund. And then we have these other intergovernmental revenue sources and um, some licenses and fees and permits. So for those sources, Mayor, well, 89% of those major sources that we talked about, sales, property, and then business taxes and utility taxes, the remaining 11% comes from a variety of both fees and rates that you see on the chart there gotcha. that essentially cover costs of services like permitting, parking services, our, our utilities um, and other important services. So that outer wheel there is all of our revenue sources. The internal wheel represents in our spending in the current biennium how we used those resources. And that's where you see how much of our revenue is dedicated to the priority area of public safety. Yeah, and it's, and it's really interesting. We talk about this a lot. And I think when you can actually look at the budget wheel and see where your money really goes, you see how much we really do, do spend. And I think it's important to know that, that we believe as a city council that our number one priority is the safety of our community. And that's reflected in how we spend our money. So this has been a great discussion. And I think next month we're going to have um, our budget person here with us to dig in just a little yeah. deeper. But we want to make sure that people understand how much money we actually take in and how much money we spend and where, more importantly, where we spend it at. So after a short break, we're going to be joined by Doc Cologne, who is our um, Tacoma 2025 strategic manager. And we're going to talk a little bit about how the priorities actually factor into the budget process. And we'll be right back. Welcome back to Inside Tacoma. For this month's Inside interview, we're talking with Jacques Cologne, Tacoma's 2025 Strategic Manager. Well, you know, we've been talking a lot um, about the budget development process, but obviously before we develop the budget, we've got to make sure that we are clearly identifying our strategic priorities um, so that we can choose what we actually fund. But with so many pressing needs, um, you know, the question is, how do we really choose and how do we really decide what we're going to spend our funding on that will have the greatest impact in our community? And so we don't do that just by osmosis or by hoping and wishing. There actually is a process and we actually have a strategic plan as a city that has actually been built and has input by those who live in the city. And it helps set our strategic priorities and our goals um, for a couple of years. So I'm excited, um, Jacques, to have you here today and to be able to talk with you just about how these priorities are set and then the impact they have on our decisions. It probably seems like an eternity ago that 2025 was created, <laughs> but here it is. We're going into 2023. Yeah. We know that um, that vision was in, an intended to be an evolving vision, as well as the document was intended to be a living docu document. Can you talk a little bit about the evolution of both the vision and the document? Sure. And you know, as I, I hear that question, I think about when we created this, what would somebody have said if we had said, um, you know, there are people living in Tacoma that are TikTok influencers that focus on cryptocurrency. So, <laughs> you know, it's, the world has changed Indeed. quite a bit Indeed. since, Indeed. Yes. since it was uh, created. But, um, you know, as the mayor said, it really is built on the community's vision. And that vision was really broad. So there are 24 different indicators that are in the strategic plan. and what the past few years have shown us is that that vision was really very wise. Um, as you said, Mayor, you know, the solutions to the problems that we see are in the communities that are experiencing them. And we've really seen that with the plan. So as we've gone through a pandemic, as we have gone through um, several crises in terms of housing and homelessness and public safety, um, 
what we've seen is that the strategic plan absolutely pointed us in the right direction and was the plan that the community needed us to prioritize what we were doing with. That said, what we have done since then is really had council and the community help focus on what are those top priority issues that we need to see. So things like affordable housing and homelessness, public safety, health, right, as we emerge from the pandemic. So um, it does continue to evolve. And um, I guess one other example that I'd love to share before uh, passing it back to you, Elizabeth, is one of the things we heard in the original plan was around graduation rates. Mm. And I think the, the nature of that conversation has changed mm -hmm. a lot since mm -hmm. then as we've Absolutely. seen the success of mm -hmm. Graduate Tacoma and the partnerships in the school district and, and beyond. So things have certainly changed, but the community's wisdom has really pointed us in a direction that's allowed us to address the, the highest priority issues as they have emerged. Well, Jacques, you mentioned it quite a few times as you were talking COVID and the last couple of years, which has really, um, in a lot of ways, changed the landscape. Mm -hmm. um, that that that, or you know, people feel like it's changed the landscape because um, you know we've seen a lot of um, issues that were a priority even become bigger issues in our community. So, talk a little bit about how has the pandemic in, impacted our strategic plan, and how are we shifting to address? Um, the needs that have now come out of that based on what's happened during the pandemic? Yeah, great question. Um, and there are so many impacts that it's hard to focus on just a few, but I will try. I gotcha. Um, you know, one area that I know we've all seen and experienced has been the impact on small businesses as we were all, you know, shuttered inside and businesses had to struggle with what this, this new um, era looked like for them. And so the city has been really intentional about trying to support our small businesses in surviving through the pandemic, right? Through loans and grants and support and technical assistance. Um, we heard in the, the, the strategic plan that folks wanted to see thriving local business districts, that they wanted uh, Tacoma residents to have access to livable wage jobs that were close to where they lived. And so all of that support that we've been providing to small businesses has really been a result of the community's vision for what a thriving local economy looks like and how we can emerge with thriving local small businesses that are really in many ways the backbone of our economy here. You know, we've been focusing some of our conversations recently and including earlier today about budget. And um, we've touched on how council priorities influence our budget both the process and hopefully the outcome, right? Um, but for the broader community, can you share in a little bit more detail about those council priority areas and how you worked with the council to facilitate um, conversations around those priority areas? Absolutely. So I mentioned that we have 24 different indicators in the Tacoma 2025 plan. Those 24 indicators are um, ranging from graduation rates increasing, to people have more access to facilities and services that they need and everything in between. As you know, the city does a whole lot. And so those 24 indicators are all necessary, but you can't have 24 priorities, right? right. <laughs> so what we've done over the past several years is we've worked with the mayor and her council colleagues to take those 24 indicators and go through planning processes where we look at what are the highest priority issues that you're hearing from your constituents right now. Mm -hmm. And among those 24, selecting which of those uh, they wanted to prioritize. And what we came away with was six of those 24 being prioritized as the council priorities. And so I'll take a moment and just tell you what those six are. Remind right. us, remind us. <laughs> so um, I should mention that I'll give you a shorthand for each of them. Okay. And each of those shorthands corresponds with a longer indicator for Tacoma 2025. So please just let me know if you'd like me to expand on them. But the six are public safety, affordable housing and homelessness, mm -hmm. health, access to facilities and services, um, livable wage jobs, and then belief that people can have an impact in their community and trust in their local government. So we call that belief and trust. So those are the six. Um, and as I mentioned before, if you were to go back in time and say, do you think this plan matches up with the needs of the community in 2025? I think just looking at those six even in particular, you can say, 
Absolutely, those are priority issues for what it means to have a thriving Tacoma moving into the future. Well, you know, and there's no argument there because as, as, as we talk about budget, as we've talked on the show in the past, the first two shows were public safety and homelessness so though, and, and affordable housing. So those, they really do line up with what's happening in community right now. And I don't think that's by accident. Um, that's, we were very smart to think ahead. And, and I- Even strategic. Even strategic, look, even yeah. strategic to think ahead about what, what, what our issues would look like. But I think more importantly is our community helped us decide what those issues were that we could focus on. So we had that list to choose from, but that list came from our community. So speaking of our community um, and how we engage them and what's important about having community engaged in these process, um, we have a new thing that we've started um, out, of, out of our budget, and that's participatory budgeting. Um, we hear it's the most democratic way um, to think about how we spend money in a city. And, um, it, and it's also an opportunity to bring community back together again, which is important because 2025 is right around the corner. So we're gonna need to be looking, about, looking at our next strategic plan. So tell us a little bit more about participatory budgeting. Boy, that's a mouthful. <laughs> I would love to. It's one of the things that I get most excited about because it really is innovative when we talk about how local government interacts with their community. So. Participatory budgeting in its most uh, basic form is allowing people to make decisions about how to spend money in their neighborhoods. Um, what that looks like is, you know, we already talked about the answers to the problems that communities are facing lie in those communities Absolutely. that are experiencing them. And I think as local government, we often have trouble translating from that lived experience to what it means to try to address it at the city level. Participatory budgeting tries to remove all of those barriers. And the way that it does that is it says, here's a, a pot of money that the city has for addressing problems in a community. And rather than doing what local governments often do, which is making a decision about how they would like to use that money and then asking the community for input about that decision that we have already made, this does the opposite. And it asks the community, if you could do anything with this money, what would that be? to address the issues that you're seeing, to improve the lives of those that, that um, are in your community. And so there are several phases to the process to allow that to happen. And at each phase of the process, the community is really the, the group that is in control and leadership. And our job as the city government is to support them in their leadership. And so the phases are idea creation. And that's where the community actually tells us, hey, if we had a million dollars in our neighborhood, this is what we would do with it. Then the second phase is really around taking those ideas and putting some more data and details to them. So, you know, it'd be great if we had a park, for example, in our neighborhood. Well, you can't just make a park anywhere. So what would that look like? Where are we actually talking about? How much money would that actually take? What partners could actually be involved? And you go through a process of working with the community on really uh, formalizing their proposals. Then you take those proposals that are built by the community members and you take them back to their community and you say, hey, your neighbors have come up with these 10 proposals. What would you most like to see? And they actually vote on which of those proposals they want to fund in their community. And so at the end of the day, you have this process where the community has come up with the ideas, the community has prioritized those ideas, and the community has funded which of those ideas they most want. And so at every step of that process, they are really leading us in the direction of what's going to make the biggest difference in their lives. So Jacques, um, the council's put its money where its mouth is in terms of participatory budgeting. And so in this year, we have $2.5 million of American Rescue Act or ARPA funding that's been dedicated to participating. Parti well, there we go again. They're, they're like particip that participatory budget. We just call budget. it PDB for P short. P to that's avoid what we that. should start saying. PDB. To PB projects <laughs> in, in two of our city council districts, District Two and District Four. Can you give us a little more detail about those specific projects? Absolutely. So the the council certainly did put their money where their mouth is, and. Um, we are going to be putting $1 million in each of the districts. Um, and so this is a significant project that we're really excited about and the community is really excited about. I'll start with District 4 because that project is already underway. Um, District 4 is, of course, our east side community. Mm -hmm. And um, we've been starting the process of creating 
an advisory panel that really is going to be guiding the city and how to develop this and who to engage and where and all of the details about how to make that work. And so that process is underway. If you go to the city's website, you can get more information about how to engage. But if you are in the Eastside community and this sounds like something that you would love to get involved with, um, that opportunity is now. And so um, would really encourage you to, to go to our website and find out where the next event is and how you can get involved in the proposal building and the idea um, creation phases. We are not going to be doing both projects simultaneously. We're going to stage them a little bit so that we can focus on making sure that District 4 gets the support that they need to have this be a successful project. And then we'll be transitioning to District 2, which is, um, for those of you that, that aren't as familiar with districts, right. that is our, our downtown and Northeast Tacoma district. And so um, that will be the second project. And we're anticipating that we'll be starting that in 2023 and are really excited about getting that project underway and um, really looking at downtown as the the hub of so much of Tacoma from around the around the city and really around the county um, and really seeing what that what ideas emerge from how folks would like to improve the livability of of downtown and surrounding areas well that's exciting thank you Jacques yeah you know it's it's I think it's uh it's so important to understand that, as, as we've said here today, that you know those who are closest to the problem, who experience it most, have the best solutions. So it's really great to know. And I want to just remind everybody, it's 2.5 and 2.5. So that that will make up that million dollar for the third district when we put the money all together. But but there will be a million dollars for each community. And I think what's even greater is that. It's not, it won't be a perfect process, right? Because we weren't waiting for perfection to make progress. And so invite everybody to participate and we're all gonna learn together um, as we move through participatory participatory budgeting. PB. I wanna say PB, but then I think yeah. of peanut butter. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> Can I say one more thing no, about that? No, please do, please so, do. Um, you saying that makes me also realize that I should mention one of the really great things about this whole process is it's not just about the outcome. You mentioned bringing people together yeah. and building shared leadership in communities. We talked about belief and trust as right. a priority of the city. So the outcome is great. You know, if there's a new playground or if there's a new park or if, you know, whatever the, the, the community decides, that outcome is great. But it's also the process that's really one of the outcomes of this and looking at how folks are coming together to problem solve about the, the, the issues that they're seeing mm -hmm. in their neighborhoods, mm -hmm. um, building shared leadership, having the, the natural leaders and communities get the support that they need to show that leadership and to expand that leadership within their neighborhoods. All of those are really crucial to having, you know, communities that are thriving, leadership within those communities that helps us move forward as a community. And I think PB can be a really key component of what it looks like for us to help support them in getting there. Well, no, and Jack, the other thing, I'm sorry, this is such a good conversation, <laughs> but the other thing that asked that is, so I was, we come out of COVID and people have been indoors and, and, and locked, not locked away, but, but just been indoors and away from each other. It's also an opportunity for neighbors to get to know neighbors and people to get to know others in mm -hmm. their community, whether they're across the street or several blocks down the street. So I think I, I really, this gets exciting for me because it really is also building that community will and that community good so that when other issues come up in a community, they can face it together and they can have conversations um, and we can work together to solve the issues that face the city. So this is a, a really exciting time for us. I love the fact that it's building on the work of Tacoma 2025. Um, and I think, I think there are lots of things that we'll see. So as we think about 2025, which is coming, um, and an update to the strategic plan or a new strategic plan, Jacques, talk a little about what we can expect in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty shocking that we're getting close to 2025 right, I can't already. believe that. <laughs> Our vision for the future is quickly approaching. Yes. Um, so yes, we will be updating our strategic plan. Um, and what I can tell you is that we're gonna start that process soon. So we're not gonna wait until 2025 to start planning for the next version of this. So um, 2023 is really when we anticipate starting to put some pieces together for what it looks like to develop a process that brings the community together to create a shared vision. 
I think if I look at what has been most successful about 2025, it really has been that it is grounded in the community's vision mm -hmm. so that you and your council colleagues always have that to point back to to say, we have heard from the community, we do know what their priorities are, as we always continue to hear from constituents Absolutely. and how those evolve. Um, but we have a pretty good idea because it was the community's vision that set out our strategic plan. And so I think our goal as a city will be to, to continue to build off of that and ensure that the next version is also a community vision yeah. mm -hmm. that steers us forward in that way. And recognize that um, that is also important because our community has changed a lot in the past 10 years. Absolutely. Um, both in terms of who is here, um, in terms of what the priority issues are, and how we want to move forward together as a community. So that will be really crucial. Um, and then how that happens, I think we would love to, to co-create and co-design that with community. Absolutely. So we have a Tacoma 2025 advisory committee made up of um, Tacoma residents and stakeholders, and they are gonna be helping to guide some of those initial planning stages starting in 2023, as I said. And as a community, I think what you can expect is to hear from us in 2023 and 2024 um, so that we can better understand what are these, the priorities for you and your family? Um, how can we capture those? Where do we see the most agreement among the community? Mm -hmm. What are the issues that are maybe um, passionate, uh, that community members are passionate about in some areas, but not in others, and how do we capture that? Um, so that we can really make sure that we're steering in the direction that the community is pointing us in. Well, this has been a really great conversation. I know we could, we could sit here all day and talk about this because I think the engagement of our community in these issues is so incredibly important. And so Jacques, thank you so much for the work that you do um, at the city and for joining us today um, on Inside Tacoma. So when we come back, we're gonna go to Inside Inquiry where we answer your questions um, right here on Inside Tacoma. We'll be back in just a few minutes. People in Tacoma of all ages and incomes deserve the opportunity to grow up and grow old in their community, which means we must increase housing choice, affordability, and supply. While there isn't an overnight fix, we can take steps today to allow for different types of housing that respect the scale and design of our neighborhoods while helping us thrive now, in a decade, and beyond. Learn more at cityoftacoma.org slash home in Tacoma. Welcome back to Inside Tacoma. Now is the segment Inside Inquiry, where you can ask the mayor and the manager questions that come from our community and we answer them. So we hear from the community in all sorts of different forums. We hear in our community forums, we hear on social media, we hear in email, and we hear through constituent letters, yes. concerns from our community. And this is one of the places that we are responsive to those questions and concerns. Well, Elizabeth, we've got a couple questions. They're two very different questions, but let's jump right in and talk about them. So the first one comes from Twitter. And it asks, why doesn't Tacoma Police, the oh, let me, I want to get the question right. So it says, why the Tacoma Police Department doesn't have any beat cops? So thank you, Mayor. And I wanted to start with just talking about what a beat cop is. Yeah. And so I went right to the source. I went to Wikipedia. That is the source. So Wikipedia explains that beat policing is based on traditional policing, late 19th century, utilizing the close relationship with community members, with a, um, cops, what they're calling cops, assigned to beats, which is parts of the community, to strengthen police effectiveness and encourage cooperation between um, the community and the police to make the community safer. So that's the definition of a beat cop. So, but what do we do in Tacoma, Elizabeth? Sure, so I wanted to share that our police department, our, we have an operations bureau, yep. and that bureau is then divided into two divisions. One of the divisions um, does the work that's kind of our equivalent of a beat cop. Okay. So the two divisions include our patrol division, mm -hmm and our community policing division. Mm -hmm. So starting with patrol, that's where you're going to get um, officers that are responsible for calls for service. So you call 911, it's patrol, that division that's going to re respond. So they conduct 
preliminary criminal investigations. They respond to emergencies. They enforce um, our laws, like traffic laws and so forth. So they they respond to a variety of different kinds of calls, and those calls are classified, you might have heard, on different priority levels, yeah. but that's where that primary call response um, resides. So the, the other division is our community policing division, and I would say that's where we come the closest to our version of beat cop policing, because this division is focused on handling neighborhood concerns, um, business concerns, that take a little more response and a little different kind of time and effort than just responding for a specific calls for, call for service. We do that through our CLO program. You've yeah. probably heard that, Mayor. That's our community liaison officers. Yep. And they work in um, partnership with other city departments, like our Neighborhood and Community Services Department, for example, um, tax and license and code enforcement. Mm -hmm. And they work in, in, together with those um, other departments because they're, they're looking at the community concern and trying to find the best way to work with the community in addressing those concerns. So Elizabeth, so in that, because we talk about beat cops, so they have a beat. Um, can we talk a little bit about how our CLOs and those two divisions actually, they have their own beat. We call them districts. Sure, they have their sectors. Their sectors, their that's sectors what they're called, that, see? That work within and across some of our council districts, okay. just to make it super confusing. Absolutely. But um, actually it's really um, clear and from the department's perspective where the areas that they're responsible for are through this program. Currently we have two lieutenants, two sergeants and nine CLOs that work in this capacity within their designated area. So their beat or their sector. Gotcha. And in that area, they get to know the community, they get to know the businesses, and they hear what the issues are. And then again, they work within that uh, cross-functional city team to try to address those um, issues. They get many of their their calls for service through our 311, our C-click fix, mm -hmm. where community, again, lets us know what their concerns in, uh, are for their area. And on any given week, Mayor, our CLOs are handling 80 to 200 wow. C-click fix reports citywide. Wow. So they this this division works really, really hard. So in addition to just building those relationships and being active in community, they then actually go out and handle even on top of that. Um, some additional issues that come through the C-Click Fix. They do, and that's not all. Wow. So there's more. So they also attend an average of 40 to 50 community me uh, meetings throughout the course of a, of a month. Mm. It's, again, another place where they hear from the community and they can interact with the community, get to know the community, and start helping resolve some of the issues that they're seeing. Um, so they work to you know, provide solutions, connect people. This, is, this, this program is really our Beat Cop equivalent because it has that same goal of connection and working together to make our community safer. Well, I, and I, I think it's really, really important. I mean, that's why I'm glad that we have a chief that really believes in that we community do. liaison we do. process because those relationships are so crucial um, when issues come up in a community. So that's an exciting part. But you know, our police officers, they work really hard um, and, and do a lot of good things in our community. And so, you know, I've got a couple of positive stories I've heard. And one is, you know, that recently an officer uh, self-dispatched to a medical aid call where a toddler was losing consciousness. Um, and this officer determined um, that the toddler inadvertently ingested um, uh, narcotics. He began CPR on this young person and the toddler, and then administered Narcan and the toddler survived because of this. And so um, in addition to everything else they do, our, 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 our police officers really do save lives. Another one was an officer arrived at a shooting scene and the officer applied a tourniquet and began CPR until fire arrived. And a, metal, a medical doctor, doctor actually indicated that without the officer's quick action, the subject would have died. And both of these officers were, were, were um, given an award, one a accommodation medal and the other one a life-saving award. So we know that, that they're out there and they're working hard in this community. There are so many great stories out there, Mayor, and, and frankly, many of them don't go recognized to that level of award, but every day, this division is focused on that service 
to and with the community. And so um, thank you for that question. No, appreciate that. So I've got the second question. So we also received um, an observation and a general question on a completely different subject. And that's how you know this, these are from community. We are answering your questions. Um, and this question was, rep was related to the city's tree programs. And specifically, why is there so much paperwork um, that goes along with actually being able to plant trees and to participate in some of these programs? So we thought we'd share an overview of not only the program that seems to have a lot of paperwork, but also on some other programs that really are increasing our tree canopy and how you as community members can participate. So Mayor, before we get into kind of details of the program and that yes. paperwork question, which is an important question, it is an important question. I want to just um, remind the community that about the city's goal in yeah, regard absolutely. to our tree canopy. So tree canopies are so connected to community health and, and well-being. So we have a goal of increasing our tree canopy from approximately 20% to 30%. So these programs are really important to helping us advance towards that goal. Absolutely, and Elizabeth, and so a couple of those programs, I'll, I'll talk about one, which is the one that has all the paperwork, but that's Grit, Grit City Trees. Um, and it runs, unfortunately, it, the time is over, um, but it runs for from, this year. For this year, but we, we do it every single year. So it runs from July to September. And again, that's called Grit City Trees. And it has, it has a goal, it's one of its goals is to support Tacoma's goal of building a tree canopy um, equitably through community planting. Now, participants in this program actually receive tree, a tree or trees, they receive tag royal, and they receive tree stakes and ties, so they get everything they need to plant a tree. Now, what happens is they fill out the paperwork, but then the trees, all of the, the actual, uh, the actual ingredients, so to say, into planting a tree, but everything that's needed um, gets delivered to them in October and November. So now, the difference in this program is that this tree, this program, Grit City Trees, is only open to Tacoma residents, and these are trees that have to be planted in the right-of-way. So for those of you who don't know what a right-of-way is, it is the part between the sidewalk and the street. So that planting strip that a lot of communities have, that's where you can actually plant the trees that you get from Grit City trees. Um, and there is no limit um, to the quantity of trees requested. However, they've got to be able to fit in that planting strip so we don't overplant. And so, Mayor, we also prioritize those areas with a lower canopy because the canopy we do have is not evenly distributed throughout right. the city. So we really focus on building up where there's even a lower tree canopy. Right, so that's where we get from being equal to equity, meaning that we're putting, we're not putting trees in the same place every year equally, but we're putting trees where they aren't, needed where, they, where they're needed the most. So Elizabeth, that talks about us. So next year, remind people next year that from July and September, please be sure to go to the website and, and sign up if you want to plant trees. But Elizabeth, when they go to the website and they sign up, then there's the paperwork. So sure. Elizabeth, can you talk about the paperwork and why there is so much paperwork for this particular program? So, so let me talk about the why a little bit yeah. because it, it, it does matter. So um, w in this program, there might be a little bit more pra paperwork, but to reach the purpose of really making sure we get the right tree in the right place. Absolutely. We want the, um, the tree to be able to live in the space that you have because this again, this is focused on the right of way. So even so, as our staff steps into evaluating the permits and really running that permit process for the applicant, yeah. they have to have a lot of details about that space so that we can get that right tree. And we need to know where utilities are, for example. Right. We need to, um, and, and that's a state law requirement mm -hmm. there. So we, we don't want to damage utilities. We want individuals to be safe. And we want the tree to grow and thrive. So the, the best chance for success. So that's the why of that additional paperwork for this program. And that makes and that makes sense because you know we've seen trees that got planted where people weren't paying attention and you see sidewalks buckle and then that goes back on the homeowner. So, right. so it's actually in some ways also protection for the homeowner Absolutely. who's wanting to plant the tree. Absolutely. So, so it's a little bit of paperwork, but it's definitely worth it. Um, so Elizabeth, can you talk a little bit about what our current stats are around tree planting? Sure. In um, from 2016 to 2021, with yeah. this program, we've provided over 1,500 trees to the Tacoma 
Tacoma community, with 59% of those going to communities with the greatest need. And that's as identified in our um, equity index. So I, I think that's a really successful measure of this program, both the, the total number of trees and where we're focusing um, this program. Well, and speaking of success, it's always great. It's not, it's not just that we say it's successful, it's because you say it's successful. So a couple of quotes that people have shared with us um, are, you know, it's a great program. My son also got two trees two years ago and they are doing great. So young people are planting trees. Is there another one, Elizabeth? Super happy with trees. Your staff made it super easy. So even if there's paperwork, we can help with that. Um, super easy and simple process. Well, and then it says, this is a really great program. It really helps to make a neighborhood feel connected and beautiful. And so we hear from people that although the paperwork is difficult or mm -hmm. can be difficult, mm -hmm. it's still worth it. So if you are interested in Grit City Trees and getting ready for next year, um, you can go to the Grit City Trees webpage and click on the tab, how do I participate to learn more? But okay, so we've talked about Grit City Trees. Now we've got the tree coupon program. Right, a whole different program. And, and Mayor, this one's super easy. <laughs> really, 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 all we need to know is the address, just to confirm that <clears throat> the eligibility of the individual for our program. And this actually is more than just Tacoma. It, it, it's anyone in Pierce County can we apply for this trying, coupon. <clears throat> trying to increase that um, canopy countywide, indeed. And, and there's more flexibility in where the trees can be planted. That's up to the um, property owner that purchased the ch purchases the trees. So, so they can plant them in their front yard, their backyard, wherever they want on their private property, those trees can get planted. And we have 2,500 coupons available. And since uh, 2012, over 3,000, well over 3,000 trees have been planted in Tacoma. And 40% of those have been provided in areas in great need in our equity uh, index map. And over 10,000, almost 11,000 trees have um, in that same time period been planted throughout Pierce County. So another really successful program. Absolutely, well, and it's, and it's pretty simple as you've already said. So you can apply for a coupon. Um, that coupon is good and you know, it's gotta be redeemed by March uh, 31st of 2023. You get a $30 coupon for each tree and you can use one coupon to get three trees. So that's a $90 savings on trees. And you get to decide what kind of tree you want right. to plant because yep. you know what's best um, um, for you. And then, and then the other thing that's great about it is that we're supporting local nurseries. So um, it, you can use that money to purchase um, trees at eight participating nur nurseries across the county. So we're also supporting our local businesses. Um, and so I think it's a really, really great program. As we said, it's available um, to all Pierce County residents. Um, the trees purchased must be at least five gallons in size to qualify. And there are lots of other um, little nuances, but it's fairly simple. And again, anywhere on your property. Um, and so this, is, um, this part is really exciting for us, again, trying to build that tree canopy. And we know that as we have these warmer summers, mm -hmm. it's nice to have a little shade in your, in your yard. Absolutely. But I think, Elizabeth, people have also shared with us the success of that program. We, we do get a lot of encouragement to keep this program going and in, in specifically we've heard just keep doing what you're doing we're very thankful for your efforts our area is tremendously greener thanks to you I think this is an awesome program and loved working with the nursery staff and continue to pr promote tree planting in our communities this is what makes Tacoma so great so, so Community loves this program. Here. Absolutely. Yeah. So if you're interested, starting October 1st, um, residents of Pierce County can visit the tree coupon program site to see if you're eligible for a coupon. And then you can also view the full list of those uh, local nurseries who are participating. So if you're ready to plant your trees this, this late fall, early winter, and even going into early spring next year, be sure to log on and get your coupon so that you can continue um, to help us grow our our tree canopy in Tacoma and Pierce County. So that's all the time we have today. Um, we appreciate you for joining us and we look forward to coming back next month to talk a little bit more about the budget, but also to really highlight how city administrators and how policymakers actually meet the community needs in order to drive success in Tacoma. We'll see you next time on, on Inside, Inside Tacoma. Tacoma.